So today is the first class of the <coughs> waves topic. We are taking some help from the from notes and we'll slowly go forward. Sir, I think you already took a class. I, I, I think I did. But maybe it was not uploaded. So hold up. Uh, from point one to point B. Do you understand the idea of wave? Uh, first thing we need to understand is what is a pulse. A pulse is a single full wave. So a pulse can be drawn in a lot of different shapes. Uh, for example, this is a pulse of a wave. And the beautiful thing about the pulse of a wave is that if your pulse is reflected off a boundary or off a wall or off a solid surface, it will have the exact reverted shape. For example, if we have a rope and we have we set on the pulse onto this rope, whereas the right side is fixed to a solid end, then this shape would be exactly reverted back, which means if this is the going in, going in shape, once it reflects off the surface, we're gonna have the shape that would look like, not like this. Here the trough is going first, so the trough will be reflected first. So when it will be reflected back, the trough will be reflected first and the test will be reflected later. So this is the shape of the reflection. So that's what happens when it will reflect. So one of the important things that is really, really important for you to understand is that Whenever waves reflect, we always have a uh, we have a 180 degree phase shift. 180 degree phase shift. Now, what do I mean by 180 degree phase shift? Let me uh, elaborate that a little bit. <coughs> Any wave can be represented by the circular motion of an object, which goes about a fixed point. And if we observe the linear motion of a circularly moving object we can have what we call an oscillation particle. So whenever any wave goes by, I mean, for example, if this is a wave, one full cycle of a wave is represented by one full circular motion of a uh, rotary object. So pretty much like a sine curve, if you consider that this is the zero degree position, uh, this would be the 360 degree position, that is 100, uh, that is one full cycle. And you can pretty much divide it into equal parts as for convenience. Few things that is pretty important for us to understand is that the angle difference between the crest and the trough is an exact 180 degree. For example, if you think this is zero degree line, this would be 90 degree, this would be 180 degree line, and this would be 270 degree. So the gap between two uh, opposite phase, the exact opposite phase of a uh, of the medium particle would be 180 degrees. And this is true for any wave. In any uh, progressive wave. What do I mean by progressive wave? Progressive wave means it is a wave that is traveling in one direction. <clears throat> so carrying information and energy in one direction. Uh, as opposed to progressive wave, we can also have stationary wave or standing wave, which is basically uh, two identical waves uh, crashing into each other at the same time. And they are also in the same plane or they have uh, identical polarization. Polarization is but it is important that they have to be in the same plane so that they will cross into each other. And as a result, the net energy flow in any direction would be zero. So that kind of wave can be called stationary wave, which is a much bigger discussion which will come up later. For any progressive wave, two particles which are uh, one degree phase difference apart are called in exact opposite phase. Important information that we need to pick up from here is that in terms of physical length, if you observe, in terms of physical length, this much length is exactly one lambda. And in terms of uh, angle, phase angle, this is 360 degree. The amount of time that any wave would take to cover lambda amount of distance is called time period. Because whenever any, any, any wave particle covers, completes one full oscillation within that same time, the waves move forward by lambda distance. So these three variables, although they are different in nature, they would be very similarly applicable uh, towards each other when the, for the case of a progressive wave. One lambda distance, this is a physical distance, unit, meter, centimeter, millimeter, something like that. This is directly relevant 
I'm not using the word proportional, I'm using the word pure event because we'll be using unitary methods to find out different relationship afterwards. One lambda physical distance is directly relevant to a time amount of time period, which is directly relevant to an angle, phase angle of 360 degree. This three part uh, arrow figure uh, would be very helpful for us later on in the calculation processes. So we'll see a lot of use for this one because uh, we do calculate a lot of the wave behavior depending upon what type of chain are we gonna have whenever a wave uh, is reflected or two different waves are bumping to each other are we gonna have some sort of constant interference or distant interference or are we gonna have both at different parts of the whole medium so we have to use this information a lot so we're gonna talk about this uh, we're gonna use this uh, very frequently this is one of the very important first stuff so I'm just gonna keep it there and Let's get on to understand further uh, for what, how does the wave work. Interesting part is that if we have two different waves, uh, actually before I get into the idea of uh, inter, uh, inter, uh, interference or superposition, they are pretty much similar uh, happening, but there is a slight bit of understanding in terms of the uh, energy combination that we are talking about i'll show you the exit definitions uh, after a while just hang on for a while for the for your level you can pretty much uh, consider the word wave interference or or superposition to be synonymous words which works for you and is perfectly uh, workable and correct for your requirement <laughs> the important part is that whenever any wave would travel from one point to another point. If we have two different waves, oh, sorry. Uh, I, was, I, should, I was trying to talk about polarization. Uh, let me get the polarization out of the part uh, first. Polarization, the idea of polarization is, is, uh, is, is that whenever we limit the vibration of the wave particles, in one fixed plane that type of a wave is what is called a polarized wave let me elaborate what it means if you consider a three-dimensional direction for example let's say this is a wall you are standing in front of a wall and this is a rope you are holding the rope close to you so this is the phase view so phase view means this is you this is you really thin to be proud of and you're holding a piece of rope in your hand that is going from you all the way to the wall now we can make transverse wave wave using this rope uh, if i try to draw the isometric view of this scenario let's say this other isometric view is something like this let's say this is the wall and here is a person who is holding the rope in their hand and the rope is going it goes attached to the wall this person can move the rope in any direction he wants to make a transverse wave. What I mean, if this rope is moved vertically up and down, something like this, he's gonna make a transverse wave. In that case, the waves are gonna be vertical. Interesting part, the definition of transverse, transverse wave is that uh, it is the type of wave where the oscillation direction of the medium particles is perpendicular to the duration of the wave. Duration of the wave means duration of the energy flow through the wave. In this case, the energy is flowing from uh, left to right for this figure, and the particles are moving up and down, so there will be perfect 90 degree over here. So, for this figure, we're going to have forward duration of wave movement uh, or energy movement, and we're going to have perfectly vertically moving particles. So, the rope particles are going to move vertically up and down. You have an entry in between them, it's perfectly working on this way. Alternately, Let's say the person stops the, this movement, the rope comes to rest once again, and then the person starts to move this uh, rope horizontally. So he can do this as well. In this scenario also, the, as the person moves the uh, end of this rope horizontally, the energy is gonna move from left to right as well, but because I have drawn this in an isometric view, so maybe the particles are al moving along this al alignment. So they are moving parallel to the floor. But once again, between the duration of the energy flow and between the movement duration of the uh, particles or you can say that along the amplitude line 
of the particles, you still have an anti-degree in between them. So which means this is also transverse wave. It is not essentially limited to only through this direction. If you think this would, is equally applicable for any other direction that the person wants to move their hand, as long as their hand movement is parallel with this wall, all of these cases, I mean, for example, he can move his hand in this direction, along this alignment, along this alignment, at some, any other angle. I mean, as long as he is moving his hand, uh, that is in a vertical plane, in a vertical plane, he will be able to produce transverse waves. In all of those transverse waves, individual transverse waves, the particles would have different alignment of their vibration, but all the energies would be traveling in a single direction. Now, this is the case where the person cannot essentially move a uh, single rope in all the directions simultaneously, which is physically impossible. He can only maintain one alignment of vibration. But there are other scenarios, for example, for light waves, uh, whenever a light comes out of a source, vivid source, uh, light is essentially the movement of charged particles, <laughs> which I think I, I might have told you if I haven't. Uh, there is one way to visualize how electromagnetic wave travels from one place to another place. Uh, did I ever tell you this, how to, how to sort of visualize electromagnetic waves? <laughs> no. Did I? No, sir. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I'm not gonna draw this because drawing this is, is meticulously difficult, more so for me. Uh, but I want, I want you to imagine and visualize. Think about it that, let's say you have a positively charged particle, try to visualize a positively charged particle sphere, which is producing an elliptic field around it. So try to imagine multiple different arrows represent the elliptic field lines coming out of the surface radially and shooting themselves in, in every direction, all directions. This positive charge sphere, assume that this is the only thing that you're seeing. So there is not, nothing, not, nothing around to disturb your view. Think about it. There is a specific orientation and alignment of this electric field. No matter where you observe from this charge particle, close to the charge particle, the field is stronger. Further from the charge particle, the field is weaker, but there is a fixed direction and there is a fixed strength of electric field somewhere away from this charge particle, as long as we keep this charge particle stationary. If I now start to move this charge particle, let's say I am gonna start to move this charge particle, I'm gonna oscillate this charge particle, but before I go for both the options, let's say I'm now moving this charge particle from left to right. The moment I'll start to move the charge particle from left to right, that alignment of the previously existing elliptic field lines that have to move as well, right? Because you are moving the source. So that orientation of the field lines cannot stay in the exact same position. It has to move. Whenever charged particles move, they produce current. And electromagnetism is an associated behavior of current. Whenever charged particles move, there is some current produced. And that duration of acceleration produces changing magnetic field. So whenever we are gonna move this charged particle, there will be a current existing and there will be some magnetic field produced around this current, which we have learned in our all of us <laughs> by right hand grip rule. Whenever conventional current flows by, along the, the if, if you represent the thumb for conventional current, the rest of the fingers give us a magnetic field lines, which means when the when this positive charge sphere was stationary, <laughs> there was no existence, existence of magnetism whatsoever, but the electric field was definitely there. The moment we are moving this spherical positive charge particle, we are going to create a variation of the electric field and we're going to instantaneously create a magnetic property of this moving charge particle. As long as it was stationary, it had no magnetic property whatsoever. The moment it starts moving, it creates a magnetic property of its own. If it is continuously oscillating, it has both a variation in its magnetic behavior and an electric behavior. So what is actually happening? Whenever we are gonna move this charged particle from left to right, let's say, 
it will produce a disturbance or variation in the orientation of this electric field. How fast this variation can be realized from this source? I mean, if you move this thing, then those previously existing field lines, they have to also move. How fast these field lines can move to realign themselves with the, with the new orientation? The speed of that realignment is changed in the change in the right meter per second, which means if I now move the charge particle from left to right, it would take one second for that change to be realized at a distance of change in the right meter. Do you understand my point? Anyone? Can you repeat it? Yes, sir. If I move this positive sphere from left to right, then the previously existing field lines have to realign themselves. The speed of that realignment is changed into 10 to the right meter per second. It means you are not going to have an instantaneous realignment or change of the elliptic field orientation around the charge particle. You're not going to have it instantaneously for infinite distance for that change of information to travel from one point to another point it is going to take some time and the speed of that information change that the source have moved that information travels to empty space at a speed of 3 meter to right meter per second so how fast the those field lines align so you can think of it i mean if you, if you try to think of some, something like a minecraft view or in a pixelated view try to think about it let's say uh, try to visualize, uh, I cannot actually draw this on this figure. Try to visualize a charge particle, a positive charge sphere, which has, let's say, uh, one, two, three, four, eight field lines coming out of it. You have moved it a bit to the right. The moment you are moving it, the, all the field lines should also move. But the field lines will take some time to move the farther they are. So try to think of a sort of a kink orientation that the field lines were initially vertical in the original position. As you are moving, the field lines are becoming a bit tilted. And the moment you come to a stop on the, on the, after moving to the right, it once again becomes vertical. So in your field line, let's say the upward vertical line, there will be a slight bend, which is gonna slowly go far away from you because that's the way, because the field wants to realign itself to the new position of the charged particle. The speed of the movement of that slanted, alignment of the field line is essentially what electromagnetic wave speed is about. How fast that change of information travels is what electromagnetic wave. And along with the electromagnetic variation, we also have magnetic variation. If you understand the electric part, the magnetic part is a perpendicular to that orientation, which is quite difficult for me to explain because I, I'm not really good at this, but there are definitely people who can explain this better, but I, I, I try to explain the electric, electrical field line orientation part. Did it make sense anyhow? Anyone? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm not good. I'm a friend, don't good. I guess I'm not good. Thank you. So, yeah. That's, uh, that's the thing. Now, wh why am I telling you this? The reason I'm telling you this is that whenever electromagnetic waves, uh, any spectrum of electromagnetic waves is created, it, created, it actually produces, it is created from the movement of charged particles. Whenever charged particles move, they create an electromagnetic wave, which in other terms can be called photon, but let's not get into that. Photon, let's consider the electromagnetic wave scenario. Whenever a charged particle moves, it produces electromagnetic wave. Electromagnetic waves from a vivid source. Vivid source means, let's say, you have a filament of light. Normal, think about it, a basic filament of a light bulb. It's a long wire that is wound into a small space. So there are a lot of particles, there are a lot of electrons which are jumping up and down in their shells to produce that light energy. They are being heated up from the resistance of the, uh, of the filament and the full flowing current. So because they are absorbing heat energy and jump into the upper shell, 
but because then that is not their designated place so they're immediately coming back to their original place and as they're coming back they're emitting the pre-absorbed heat energy into light energy that's basically how the filament works so it's continuous jumping jumping of back and forth jump of electrons and that's that movement of electrons is essentially what produces the electromagnetic waves or that we call light for vivid sources the light can be produced in a lot of different direction because there is no specific control for ex exactly in which direction these electrons can vibrate they can take the, make their vibration horizontally they can make their vibration vertically they can make their vibration at some any other angle so if you have a normal light source regular light source the light rays which would be coming out from this light source would essentially be having their vibration in all possible angles so something like if there were let's say uh, infinite number of people holding this end of the rope and they are all rotating in infinite different angles you're going to have a mm, mashup of 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 a of, of transverse waves where all the transverse wave would have can have different angles this is the type of transverse wave that we call unpolarized transverse waves where the primary logic is intact primary logic is that the the alignment of the particle vibration is perfectly perpendicular uh, with the wave direction so the particles are vibrating up and down or left or right or some diagonal angle but their alignment of vibration is perpendicular to the direction of the wave that's perfectly good but it can have a lot of different direction this is what we call unpolarized light polarized light on the other hand is can be achieved by some sort of filters which are called polarizers one of the one of the ways that uh, i mean i mean the physical structure of polarizer is a bit difficult to visualize uh, or for me to explain uh, but one of the physical example that i can tell you is that is some maybe something like this uh, how can i put this okay yeah uh, have you kids seen the a mincing machine that makes meat into small minces Yes, sir. That you roll it by hand or roll it by some electrical uh, motor, and you feed the meat through a opening, and it become comes out in small grubs. Yes, sir. The reason the missing machine works is that you fed the meat to a very constricted hole size, and that hole about I love it. That hole size is essentially what makes the meat into that. A polarizer is somewhat similar for a light. What happens uh, is that hey, I love this. what happens is that if we send some unpolarized light through here, the, the, the typical symbol for unpolarized light is <coughs> we give arrows in all directions. So we can give arrows in all directions, something like this. So multiple different arrows. Don't worry. One of the uh, the way we represent the polarization, let's say this is going to be our path of movement for the polarized light. So the unpolarized light is labeled like this. Let's say we have like this, and then we can give arrows. But I'm not drawing vertical because I'm sitting at some angle. So we can have vertical arrows, horizontal arrows, angled arrows, but at about forget about this so i'll try to draw it again many different directional arrows so let's say like this this cost arrows so this is the typical symbol for unpolarized light which means that the light has its uh, vibration element in many different angles now if we send it to a polarizer a polarizer is sort of like uh, you can think of it as a physical mechanism which has vertical slices, unlike the uh, mincing machine, the mincing machine has some has small holes. So if you think that the polarizer have long vertical holes, long vertical holes, which means something like uh, like uh, like this. Let's say, eto monokoro hoche polarizer amonte eriko monik gula lamba 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 holes. So they are holes like this. Do you get my point? They're like, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how to put this. What is the physical object that has shapes like this? Okay. 
it's like a sieve without the without one set of uh, uh, wires only with only one set of wires so it has long holes money not deep long but laterally wrong so if we play a place a polarizer over here let's say if we place a polarizer over here that has vertical sl slates for example let's say it's like this in, a, in this orientation and the light goes through the output light would, would become polarized in that orientation would become polarized in that orientation the reason it happens is that these physical slits are of such alignment that they will allow the vertical vibration of the light rays to pass through them completely but it would absorb all the other orientations partially and it will completely absorb what is horizontal so the way the polarizer works is that it allows something that is perfectly aligned with its whole orientation to go through it 100 percent everything else is reduced partially and anything that is perfectly perpendicular for example let's say this is the orientation of the polarizer the waves which are perfectly horizontal for example let's say a set of waves which is a, which had an orientation like this uh, let me draw it let's say red this wave would be completely absorbed into this polarizer whereas this vertical wave would be completely passing through the polarizer that's how the polarizer physically works and this is what we call a plane polarized wave where this is uh, essentially uh, having a very specific orientation of the light movement one of the beauty of, of polarized light is that it can help us to reduce the glare uh, glare is uh, because of what glare is uh, i'll tell you glare is is what is the unnecessary light that can cause you to lessen your vision on stuff that you would want to see otherwise for example let's say if you're trying to uh, take a catch in a day night match of cricket uh, sometimes uh, the fielders put on some colorful goggles in their eyes those are polaroid glasses the polaroid for the polaroid coating makes it look like a rainbow glass what it does is that whenever they're trying to take a catch, it cuts off the very bright light from the floodlights and allows the player to see the ball on the sky more clearly. Without that thing, I mean, they would their eyes would get blinded by the very strong light of the floodlights, and they might not be able to see the ball that well. So that's the reason that uh, that uh, polarizer glasses work. Another useful polarizer glasses is for fishing. Uh, <coughs> I'm talking. I'm saying, telling you about the uses so that you can make some uh, understanding for how why how this is very important for us. Is that uh, polarizer glasses can be used to uh, reduce uh, reduce the reflection of the sun uh, from water surfaces. So the way it usually happens is that let's say this is a water surface, and there is a fish, and there is a fisherman who wants to kill this fish. For whatever reasons so the sun's rays are coming by sun's rays are generally unpolarized so it has all sorts of duration of rays whenever the light ray falls onto a water surface water surface being pretty flat significant portion of the light gets reflected the way water behaves is that these light the any light rays which is reflected off the water surface become horizontally polarized and the light rays that goes gets uh, refracted into the water that become vertically polarized that's how water behaves why does that water water behave like that i don't have that answer but this is an observation that water reflects horizontally polarized light and it allows to refract or it, it allows to go through vertically reflected light now the problem that happens is that if this light enters into our eyes we'll be seeing a reflection of the sun which is over here which would be seen onto the water which we know we want to see the fish so we would want this dim light which entered into the we would like to see this dim light which entered into the water surface got reflected of the fish came up to the surface and got reflected and immediately could, could possibly reach the person's eye we want to see this one we do not want to see this one this would blind our vision onto this fish so that's where the fisherman can put up some uh, polar glasses which is going to cut off all the horizontal light and their goggles let's say this is the goggles these goggles would have perfectly vertically oriented uh, polar filters. You can never see these physical filters because they are atomic level filters. It would look like a regular sunglass anyway, but it would cut off all the horizontal reflection and allow the person to see very clearly underneath the water surface. 
uh, this same type of polar cluster are also used for Formula One racers or MotoGP racers uh, to avoid the Morichika and Rizianoki. Mirage. Mirage. It's called Mirage, I think. I mean, if 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 if, if, if you have, uh, well, you you might have actually seen that on a very hot uh, summer day. If you're in a traffic jam, yeah, the, the pitch actually gives out some uh, moving kind of uh, air, which yes. kind of stops are moving by. So uh, this this light that comes through that type of refraction, they are also they can be, they can also give uh, uh, wrong information to the high speed racers, which can be very fatal for their safety and everyone else. So uh, they put up uh, on their helmet, they put up those uh, Polaroid filters so that uh, they would always see the perfect road. They, their vision would not be confused by that uh, reflect, refracted light from the heating effect. So this is the, some of the practical uses. I will show you some videos regarding this. Uh, there is a channel, Physics Girl, who made some amazing video, trippy videos for polarization. After polarization, we'll get back to superposition. Don't worry about that. It's a continuous process. Yeah, I'll show you this one, the all of it. Uh, so you first see, try to grab what she's saying, and then I'll come to discussion. This is also very good. Okay, let's see this one. Thanks to Brilliant.org for supporting PBS Digital Studios. I'm here in LA with my friends, William Osman and Alan Pan. You guys are gonna do a little bit of art here. And just decorate it with strips of tape. This real cheap, clear tape. Okay, yeah. do you want lots of overlapping or? Up to you. I'm doing a lot of overlapping. Mine looks like a pretzel stick with really big salt crystals. <laughs> I don't know what's gonna happen here, but now you're making me excited. So this piece has Alan's hair on it. Where's the hair? It's right, you see the, the long bubble? <laughs> Hermione is not happy with Ron and Harry right now. <laughs> Go ahead and look through- Sir, video on a bhenge bhenge Sorry? Sir, video to bhenge bhenge to Sonic. One FPS or moto hai Oops, then how can I help that? Sir, the rest of them are the same. Yes, sir. I'm going to On a low FPS frame. I'm going to go to the next I could reduce my FPS. See if that works. At the light. This looks like tape. I can see there's a button. Is this better? Sir, I'm going to go to the next one. Yeah, I'm going to go Bunch of fingerprints because I like how there's like little circles. Okay, nothing. These are our polarized sheets. Now hold this behind it. Okay. Put this one in front of it. Whoa! Whoa! There's colors! No, turn it. Like turn the Oh! The colors are changing! It's like an ugly Whoa! It's like an ugly wreath. <laughs> that's beautiful! That's not ugly. Dude, that's I love this demo! Okay. Just to clarify, you can do this demo in a few different ways. Behind the plastic with the tape, you can either put an LCD screen or one of the polarized sheets. And then in front of the plastic, you either wear polarized glasses to look at it, or you can use a second polarized sheet. Amazing! You don't have a clear plastic fork, do you? I, I may. <laughs> That's really awesome! Dang! So Wait, all right, we got knives. I don't have forks though. Whoa! How could you tell like what's going Whoa, on? Whoa, there's some stuff what? going on here too. Little that peachy is so plastic cool. petri dish. Oh, no. Whoa! Oh, that's cool. I love how you can see where all the stress concentrations end up. Like the this is like relatively like gradual transition and then it just gets crazy. Yeah, the right glasses. there. Yeah, engineers actually use a similar setup of polarizers to look for stress in material samples. It's called a polarimeter. Okay, so how is it that you can get these crazy, beautiful rainbow colors when all of these things are either clear or gray? Let's start out by talking about what these are. Polarizers. The lenses in your polarized glasses, those are polarizers. They're filters that let through light with a certain orientation. 
I'm going to ask you very politely to pretend, please, that this rope is a light wave. Except light is not a rope that waves up and down, it's an electric field going up and down with a perpendicular magnetic field also waving. So light waves can go up and down, but they can also go side to side and diagonally. And the direction that the electric field waves is called the polarization of the light wave. So rope, not light, please pretend. Vertically polarized, horizontally polarized, diagonally polarized. Light reflecting off of puddles and oceans is often horizontally polarized. Depends on the angle, depends on the flatness of the water, but keep it in mind. I should probably also mention before someone in the comments scolds me for not mentioning that there's also circularly polarized light and elliptically polarized light, but those come from adding different linearly polarized light waves together, like this horizontal and this vertical light that are out of phase. And then there's unpolarized light, which is most light. And that's just a bunch of random polarizations added together. Great. Okay, now, polarizing filters only let through light of a certain polarization. For example, if this is a vertically polarized filter, it'll only let through light that is vertically polarized, and it'll block the rest of the light. Interestingly, the light that has a diagonal polarization, some of that will get through because it has a component in the vertical direction. This is very important. So, it allows the vertical lights, but also allows portion of other alignment. This is very important, which is going to be helpful for us in the later part of analysis law. I'll show it to you. So how much of that light gets through depends on how vertical the diagonal angle is. And so now if you want to block light reflecting off of water, you should be blocking the horizontal polarization. So you use a polarizing filter that's oriented vertically. That's what manufacturers do with polarized sunglasses. They orient their polarized lenses so they're blocking horizontally polarized light. So if you have polarized sunglasses, you can turn them side to side to make sure that they're blocking light reflected off of flat water surfaces. Also yeah, this was amazing. Uh, I was you can turn them side See, whenever she is doing this, she is mostly seeing what is inside the bucket, underneath the water. Because now the horizontal lights are mostly blocked. I decide to make sure that they're blocking light reflected she's getting all the reflection of the surface, not seeing inside the surface, because now all the vertical lights which are coming from underneath the water, the refracted rays, those are being blocked. And exclusively the uh, other thing, uh, what is the, uh, the, the horizontal lights which are allowed to pass through. So that's basically the variation that what the water can do to the unpolarized light. The reflected lights become horizontally polarized and the refracted lights which went underneath the water and which reflected off, that becomes vertically polarized off of flat water surfaces. Also, light from LCD monitors is polarized because LCD screens have a polarizing filter in front of them. So light from your laptop screen is probably polarized. And though some animals can detect this polarization with their eyes, us humans can't do it without the aid of sunglasses. Or can we? Physicist on biology. Hmm? Human can actually perceive the polarization of light. And you will also during this video. Maybe. But let's first understand how and why some animals perceive the polarization of light. The natural world is full of flat surfaces that can linearly polarize light, such as wet leaves or bodies of water. The scattering of light in the atmosphere or underwater can also partially polarize light, and all this information is used by animals for a variety of reasons. For example, polarization is perpendicular to the direction of sunlight. So birds, insects, and even some mammals use it for orientation when they can't see the sun directly. Cuttlefish, who have this amazingly subtle perception of polarization, use it to prey on silvery fish, even with their light reflecting camouflage, and other predators are even able to detect the most transparent animals thanks to polarized light. This is because light becomes polarized when it's passing through the animal's tissues, and the poor prey becomes visible to the predator. So, the point is, polarization of light is an extra piece of information that animals make use of in many different ways. But how about humans? Well, first, let's try something. Get this video full screen and look at it. You can also do that with any blank image if you don't trust me. Now, tilt your head from left to right slowly while looking at your LCD screen. Tell me if you see anything. It feels like there's spots. What kind of spots? Like there's a spot in the middle and then it kind of looks like lines, like diagonal lines. I don't see it. What color? Is there a color? It's just kind of yellow? I don't know. Oh! Okay, maybe it's just in the middle because I was looking in the middle. Yeah, I, there's like 
some yellowness, I guess. It like looks a like this. Streak. Okay. It looks like a, like a like blotches out. Like it's, that. It's... If your screen is cleaner than Physics Girls, a very faint yellowish and blue pattern of the size of your thumb should appear. If you don't see it, or if you're not really sure of what you're looking for, the pattern should look like this. That's yeah, what, like that's uh, what it looks like. yeah. That's what it looks like. Yeah, like yeah but oh, color. is there supposed to be blue too? I didn't I notice didn't... any blue, but yeah, I noticed the squish yellow stain. This pattern. This is only applicable if you are watching this on an LCD screen. So for those of you who have LED screens or you are seeing using ICRT monitors, you're not gonna be able to see it naturally. But this is what you are expecting to see. So they now they have colored it so that every one of us can see. The pattern is called the Eidinger's brush, and it is thought to be caused by the presence of yellow pigments arranged circularly in the retina. So there you go. Yes, humans can see the polarization of light. Some humans can see polarized light. That is so cool. Biology earns some cred from the Physics Girl channel today. Okay, back to the final little mystery of our demo. Why the crazy colors? So the key is the tape. Whatever the material the tape is made of actually twists or turns the polarization of light as it's passing through. It twists it differently for different colors of light. So you get the polarized light passing in, it's turned and twisted, and then it hits the second filter. Only light of certain colors has been twisted to the right amount, twisted to the right angle so that it can pass through the second polarizing filter. And most of the rest of the colors are blocked. So you get preferentially some colors passing through and not others as much. Now if you turn the second polarizing filter more, then it's different colors that have twisted the right amount to get through. And the result is fan up. It's cool. Thank you so much to Leo who came in and offered that super interesting information. You can check out his channel. It's called Dirty Biology and I link to it in the description. It's in French, FYI. Also, thank you to Alan Pan and William Osmond who helped out. Their channels are awesome. They do crazy, funny engineering projects. I've linked to their channels in the description as well. Thank you for watching and happy, happy physicsing. physicsing. I'm gonna go take a nap. Just kidding. I'd like. Beyond this, we have the ad, so I'm not gonna add the, uh, do that. Uh, other thing that you can see over here is uh, this thing for us that explain and experiments. Uh, or should we see something else? I think I made my point. Any question? I'll take questions now. Shoot. Did it make sense? Did the video make sense? How is the, oh, the heart reflected light horizontally polarized? Like, it's not... Uh, it's something to do with the surface orientation of the water molecules, uh, which can come, which not can, which usually comes from the typical orientation of water molecules when they are on the surface because there's a thing called surface tension which makes the alignment of the water molecules in such a way that the reflection becomes horizontal. So what I want you to understand that the water molecules exactly on the surface are not at the same tension level as the water molecules underneath the surface because surface tension is a thing. Uh, Surface tension happens because of the Van der Waals attraction force and also uh, water molecules are slightly polar. So they have a uh, slight ionic attraction between them. That orientation causes the light to become uh, horizontally polarized. I mean, it's, it's, it's embedded within how the surface particles are arranged. I'm not getting into the exact information for how water molecules are arranged, but it has to do with the orientation of the surface molecules that causes the polarization in that orientation. Make sense? So that's about the polarization. So uh, you don't have to essentially do uh, all these stuff. Polarization uh, basic data would say uh, lights can be polarized or unpolarized. Uh, and, and whenever a light goes to a, whenever unpolarized light goes to a polarizer, it will uh, allow uh, the orientation of the light that is perfectly through this thing and all the other lights would be passing through at some angle and it will allow that fraction. So you can see over here that this vertical light, which is perfectly aligned over here, is gonna go through co com completely. And the light that is perfectly perpendicular to the orientation of the polarizer will not go at all, which brings us to the fraction of cos theta. 
because the way cos theta works is that when theta equals to zero, cos theta equals to one. Theta equals to zero gives cos theta equals to one, which means that for zero degree angle between the orientation of the light and the polarizer, we're gonna have the full reflection. And whenever it is 90 degree, we're gonna have zero passing through, which is essentially given in another figure over here right at the end of this uh, thing, uh, where it's, uh, this is the thing. So polarization we have over here. Property of a certain chromatic radiation in which the direction, the magnitude of the vibrating in the fields are related in a specific way, specified way. The Malassez law tells us that if we have unpolarized light that is fed to one polarizer, in this case, which is vertical, it is gonna give out the, it's gonna convert the unpolarized light into a vertically polarized light. If we now send it to a second polarizer, which is uh, named to be analyzer, but this is exactly identical to that, this one. Now, how much intensity of light are we gonna get on the right side? And the idea is that, that if the amplitude of the light for this one is A naught, and the amplitude of the light over here is A, then depending on the angle, uh, cosine portion of that amplitude of light is gonna be passing through. So A equals to A naught cos theta. So that theta is basically the alignment uh, angle between the second polarizer and the first polarizer. And because in this is proportional to amplitude squared, <coughs> uh, so we can have this a a equation as well. So A squared is equal to A naught squared cos squared theta. That can also be helpful in some other calculation for us. So that's basically about the polarization for how much you have to know for your syllabus. Uh, Mass's law is important. Uh, it is used for in a, in a lot of cases for mathematical calculation. We're gonna see some mathematical problem about this later on, but this is basically the three part that you have to understand. The reason I brought about polarization um, before I went into the idea of uh, superposition is because it is important, really important, that if we want to have superposition means two waves interfering into each other and producing a combined uh, effect, we have to have both of those waves in the same plane. We cannot have polarization of, uh, of waves which are at 90 degree with each other. If two waves are perfectly at 90 degree with each other, then they I can simply go past through each other without even uh, having any sort of uh, interference or any sort of combination effect. So that is one thing. So if we want to have uh, in, in interference between two waves, two identical waves, we have to have them along the same plane. The opposite thing is also very useful. One of the very in, interesting usefulness of a polarizer is that if you think about it, whenever we do a cellular communication, let's say you are making a call uh, from your cell phone through the tower. So your cell phone is communicating, communicating through the tower. So you are using a very specific range of the electromagnetic spectrum uh, at that instant which can change for different calls for different location of yours. But uh, depending upon your network operator, you are gonna be allowed a very specific value of the electromagnetic spectrum, the microwave range uh, for your call for a certain instant. So both of your cell phone and the, and, and the uh, tower are communicating, communicating at the exact same frequency value. So it would be very difficult for the communication to be successful if my sent waves and uh, sent waves from the uh, antenna, they are both in the same plane because that way halfway somewhere in the halfway path, they would interfere into each other. And as a result, in some places we're gonna have constructive interference, some places we're gonna have distorted interference. So all the information that we are trying to send to the antenna or all the information that the antenna is sending, trying to send to our phone, they would not be transferred properly. So the way it works is that embeddedly within the software, the cell phone and the antenna, they work together in a perfectly 90 degree polarized microwave. So let's say my cell phone is using a, 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 a microwave a frequency of let's say 100 Hertz. Microwave is not 100 Hertz, let's assume 100 Hertz for the sake of discussion. And the, 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 the telephoto communication tower is also using 100 Hertz to communicate with my phone. And that is exclusive for my phone at that instant. So no one else is using 100 Hertz of, of microwave frequency at that instant who are connected to that tower at that instant. So if the cell phone tower is sending me vertical waves, my cell phone will automatically send the tower horizontal waves. So that these two waves can pass through each other to the same exact physical space without interfering into each other. That way the information would not get clumped up or we are not gonna have constructive disturbance interference. This is one of the critical way, or this is one of the critical things which can make uh, 
uh, cell phone uh, uh, simultaneous transmitter and receiver at the same time because of the polarization it is possible when the polarization was not properly introduced in electrical circuits uh, we did not have the privilege that's essentially when the walkie talkies were developed you know walkie talkies uh, do you guys know what walkie walkie talkies yes sir the whole yes, black receiving units yeah the way walkie talkies work is that there is a switch uh, uh, and you have to press that switch to make it into a transmitter so if you try want to transmit something to the uh, uh, to the tower you have to press that switch and you have to talk through it and the typical st uh, style for communicating through walkie talkies is that you have to send some say something and then you have to say over and once you say over that's when the that's when uh, you have to let go of the switch and that's when your uh, unit becomes a receiver so whenever you're pressing your work it's working as a transmitter whenever you're letting go of the switch it's working as a receiver so it can work as either of them not both of them simultaneously because uh, walkie talkies don't work with polarized uh, signals they work with basic unpolarized signals so it can only work as one of them at a time it is either receiving or it is sending but cell phones can do both because it can work with the alignment and that's what makes them far too cooler and easier to use compared to walkie talkies make sense yes sir so that's that and malice's law effective vision law is basically uh the i mean scientist malice actually found out this relationship that the uh second uh, the output of the analyzer uh, polarimeter or polarizer would be related relevant by the cosine ratio so this is what he came up with in the first place so the idea is if the two polarizers are perfectly aligned with each other. For example, if these two polarizers were both vertical, you would have A equals to A naught because then cos zero would give you cos 90, sorry, cos zero would give you one. That would mean that all the uh, first light that came up to the first polarizer could pass through the second polarizer unabsorbed at all. So there would be intact, it would be intact altogether. But that whenever we're going to start to introduce the angle, it is going to start to absorb more light. And how much, how much amplitude should be allowed to pass through? is dependent on the cosine ratio and the theta is the angle between the two polarizer why last theta king also eta this is just a relationship between a square because i is i mean we just squared this equation we just squared this equation so the way this this i have a mouse over here okay i i think i wrote in this figure okay i can take this out and write about it here So the, the way it would be helpful for us uh, for calculation is that because if we if we if we if we square this equation we get this one so we can uh, we can also write that uh, a square by a square equals to n r square cos square theta so we can write that the second intensity would be how how, how can I put this. Oh, okay. Yeah, I equals to I naught cos square theta. Yeah, that's the equation that we're gonna get, which was not given in this formula, but I should have had included that. Okay, I might be able to write this. Don't know big deal. So how how does this come in? Because here you have a look. I proportional to a square. What I proportional to a square can be written that uh, I by a square equals to I naught by a naught square. So we can have that because they are proportional to each other. So uh, we can place in place of a square. I mean, if we have the ratio over here, we can write uh, a naught square divided by a squared equals to i naught by i. We just uh, cross change the position, which can give us here a naught square is this one, and a square is this one. So if I replace the a square value, this would be a naught square cos square theta. Uh, where on the top you get a naught square, which is given by i naught by i, and you can cross this all up. up. So if you do the cost multiplication, you're gonna get i equals to i naught cos square theta. So what is important is that 
the amplitude would be controlled by only the cosine ratio, whereas the intensity would be of the say after the same. This is the I and this is the I naught, or I can write this is the, the for this one the I naught and for this one which is A, uh, the final amplitude. So the intensity would be relevant for a cos square ratio by Malassez law, where the amplitude would be relevant to only the cosine ratio. That's the difference. Okay, sir. Sure. Thank you. No problem. <laughs> so now we'll be going, going back to the idea of uh, superposition. Uh, what? Uh, so this is a little bit of recap for. Acha, is the prayer time over? I ought to give you some bit for the Mari prayer. No, sir. Ten minutes left. Sir, what the parts? So, please take 10 minutes. Uh, we'll resume class at 6.55. I'm pausing the recording. I have resumed the recording, so we'll go uh, on from here. Hi, sir. Yep. Hi. So, this is the part that we are discussing for the intensity thing, and we discuss about the polarization, and now comes the idea of superposition. The idea of superposition is very simple. At places where the two meeting waves crest should be added, they will undergo, or, or if if same phase of two different waves are merged together, uh, will have constructive interference where the total amplitude will be the sum of the individual amplitudes a1 plus a2. Uh, so if similar uh, phase adds up, uh, that's what we call so constructive interference. And if dissimilar phase, for example, uh, crest particles merging with uh, trough particles for two different waves uh, going on to each other. Uh, that's what we call destructive interference. So for the case of destructive interference, the resultant amplitude is calculated by the difference of those two amplitudes. Because I use the word difference, uh, I'm gonna use the modulus over here. So any of them could be bigger than the other, but ultimately the amplitude would be the difference of these two quantities. So for this is what we mean by, uh, mean by constant and destructive waves. So if we have this thing happening continuously, then we can get a stationary wave, which means that we are gonna send a wave from one source straight up and we're gonna send an equal and opposite wave from the other direction. And whenever they will merge with each other, we are going to end up with a stationary wave, which I showed you in the earlier class through the uh, animation, uh, we, which I, I think we can pull up a little bit to have a bit of a revision. It was not animation. What is it called? Uh, what is the thing called? Where you can control stuffs? Mm. Simulation, simulation, yes, exactly. So, yeah. <laughs> so this is the thing that we have had. So here we have, have the other end uh, locked up. And if we give one pulse, instead of giving one pulse, it's gonna come back in reverse order. So we lose that damping and if we give a, a little bit of low tension then we can see the whole thing reflecting backwards in the exact opposite pattern and it is, it is key that the reason this it is continuously happening because we have made the damping zero damping is essentially the amount of energy loss that happens in a, in a medium so uh, we do not uh, because that there was zero damping that's why the wave is everlasting the, or the pulse is everlasting uh, which we, which is a way to show that uh, this can happen. And if we have, uh, hold up, uh, how can I stop this restart? Okay. So if I, if, I, if I go for a bit of a manual thing, let's say if I now move it as a wave and make it stop, you'll see that this thing is gonna come back and forth. It's 
slow, 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 per un secondo. Okay, something like this. So what is essentially happening? Uh, what is the stop? So this is the production of a wave. So this was a uh, undisturbed medium. So we are sending one wave. So this, this whole thing is one medium. So now as you can see that the crest is first approaching the uh, lock position or this is the time something called the reflector, reflecting end and the trough is going afterwards. Uh, whenever the reflection will happen, the crest will get reflected first. So now over here in this location, we have the reflected crest, which is a trough, and the incoming trough, which was originally a trough. Think about it. Within this part, we have two, two troughs. One is the re crest reflected trough from this end, and the incoming trough as well. And as a result, you can see over here that the amplitude has got bigger, significantly bigger, compared to a general wave. So I'm only showing you one single wave that has overlapped onto itself. The So imagine that there is a individual location, so, so uh, uh, well, if I annotate, let's say, with a draw, draw. So let's say this is this was the original uh, crest uh, trough of the wave, and the reflected trough was also of the same size. So whenever they get overlapped onto each other, their individual amplitudes get added together, and you get a much bigger amplitude. My drawing is not perfect, that's why it's not apparently looking like to be double, but the mathematics hold up. Uh, so that's why this is uh, coming back, and we are having this shape. And this thing, as more waves come in and more waves get reflected, this will keep on happening. And we're going to have alternate sections of constructive and destructive interferences. So which I'm going to show you if I just let it unpause. Uh, how can I here? Here. Pause. Almost, 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 almost. Okay, we have a pretty good uh, stationary wave over here, but it's not very perfect. Sir, so, Ermane ki wave gula eternally add up with the thugbe? Exactly. At some places they're gonna be uh, positively added, which means uh, crest part get added with the crest part. That is what is happening over here. At some other instances, they're gonna get oppositely added. I, I have to fix up the amplitude of this source for a very uh hold up if i give high tension then i get stop or is stop Just a second, I'm trying to produce exactly two waves within this part. So I would need to increase the amplitude, which reduce the frequency a little bit. Okay, let's see. What I'm trying to get is two full waves within this segment. So I now have a bit of a trouble. The trouble is that how many waves do I have over here? Have a look. 1.5 or no 1.75 1.75 1. 1. 1.75 would break our crest. do you see that this is one full wave and then half and then 0. 0.25 so this is something that i don't want to have i want to achieve two full waves in between this space because i cannot vary the space so i have to all that i can do is i can uh increase the frequency to smallen up the amplitude so oh, sorry the wavelength so let's say I'm going to increase the frequency. I'm going to keep this tension over here, no problem. Let's restart and play and let's see if we can achieve that. I'll pause right here. Now we need a bit more, right? Yes. A little bit more. Okay, let's restart. 
I have a reason to get to this value. I'll tell you in a bit that why am, am, I, am I hard on to get on this, that exact value. Almost all right, I think. So we now have two compute waves over here. So now try to understand what is about to happen. The instance this much crest part will be reflected. It will become a trough on the reflection part and that will overpose onto this incoming trough. So there we are gonna have two troughs overlapping onto each other. Then as this upcoming trough gets reflected, it will become a crest and that will overlap onto this part. So we're gonna have increased amplitudes at locations and at some other parts we're going to have decreased amplitudes. I'm going to show you some uh, another uh, orientation of this thing. So for the timing if I yeah is it happening properly? Yeah this is almost uh, almost good. This is almost good. Well every once in a while we have a little bit of variation but for most part okay what you can essentially see over here is that this is a stationary point almost we over here we have an almost stationary point as if no wave is passing through this point do you see that whereas this midpoint this mid particle is having the biggest amount of movement so the way it is actually working out uh, i'll show you another animation for this but take my word uh why did it become asynchronized <laughs> what did i do So I have paused it. So these are the locations where we have the highest amount of amplitude is the, are the locations where you have the biggest sum of amplitudes. Biggest sum. Biggest sum means you have the total sum value of the individual waves, which is A1 plus A2, that is biggest at this location here, here, here. These are the points that we call antinodes of a stationary wave. And these are the locations where which apparently are pretty much stationary, this, these unlucky points or this, these locations are where the medium particle is always undergoing some sort of destructive interference. There is a sequential figure for this, which I can pull up and I hope I'll be able to make sense. I, I, I have it somewhere. I think I have it in this, do I have this in this note? I don't, I should have had this in this note. I'll, I'll add this up in this note. I don't but I have it somewhere in my QC, I'll, I'll find it for you. Just a second. Hall effect, waves, stationary waves, graphic, there you go. This is the thing that I'm talking about, okay? Everyone have a very good look at this figure, although it's, it's, it's a bit big for you to see. Uh, so I'll maximize the vertical spacing and zoom in, zoom on it. <laughs> I want you to see this full thing that is happening in a certain medium. For the time being, disregard the source. <coughs> Try to assume that in this case, we are having two individual blue waves passing horizontally. One of them is going to the right, the other one is going to the left. Currently, for this instance, they are both perfectly overlapping onto each other. So that's why we have dash dot dash dot on top of each other. But if you just have a look at the next wave, you can see that this was the position of the both the waves at this instant. Now the dotted dotted crest, this is the crest of the dotted wave that has moved a bit to the right and this dashed wave that has moved a bit to the left. Do you see that? So if you compare these two figures, you should be able to say that which wave is going in which direction. Can you tell me what is in which direction is the dotted wave moving in which direction is the dashed wave moving? One is moving to the right and the dash, dash one is moving to the left. Which one? Sorry, sorry, Ifat? Dotted one is moving to the right and the other one is moving to the left. Exactly. The dotted one is moving to the right and the dashed one is moving to the left. Achha, for, to make better sense, I can actually, can I select this picture and take it out? Uh, where is the select button? Is 
Is this whole thing a single picture? Yes. I hope it works. I sincerely hope it works. No, it doesn't. Copy it for me. No. Okay, these are individual pictures, so, so I cannot essentially do anything to it. Okay, I'll just do this. Uh, close all, no save. I'll reopen this thing. All right. <clears throat> so, what is it that I just did? Uh, let me explain what, what, what I'm trying to achieve here. Okay. So, what I wanted to see, have a look. The shape of the vibrating guitar string due to a, a formation of a stationary wave in air. At the instant of the string is plugged, a progressive transverse wave travels around from left to right. The wave is reflected back from the end of the string, and the result is a stationary wave. The principle of superposition can be used to explain how two progressive waves traveling in opposite direction can produce a stationary wave. Now, see with this sequentially. Here, they have used some certain time frame. Capital T represents the time period. And have a look, at t equals to zero, the wave traveling from left to right, which is the dotted wave, and the wave traveling from right to left, dash dash, coincide exactly, shown as that dash dot dot dash. The sum of these two waves, the green, is a single wave with twice the amplitude. So at this very instant, which we are defining as t equals to zero, so it is the uh, start of our observation, both the waves are falling onto each other perfectly. So here, two troughs adding up, getting you a very large amplitude on the lower side. Here, two crests adding up together, giving you a very high amplitude on the upper side, and vice versa, it is happening along the entire, ent entire construction. After a while, the waves are going to separate out, individual waves. We're not going to see the individual waves, but we are using the individual waves to find out what is going to happen to the overall string. You have to understand that the green line is uh, actually what we can see for the actual string, which is acted upon by these two blue waves. So we are not going to see an individual effect of the blue wave. We're going to see a combined effect of both the blue waves, which is going to altogether result in the shape of the green wave. Do you understand this much? I mean, if I just put it into a basic simple term, let's say if you apply two Newton force onto an object and another person pushes the uh, four Newton force on the same object, you're not going to see the individual effect of two Newton and four Newton force one at a time. You're going to see a combined effect of both the forces onto the same object, right? What I need you to understand that both of these blue waves are working on the same guitar string on the same medium simultaneously. So we're going to see a combined effect of both of these waves at a given time. So what is happening? At t equals to t by 8, here the t means uh, the, the time period. So we are talking about 1 8th of a time period. So that's a pretty small amount of time. So this wave has moved on by a little bit and this blue wave has moved on uh, on the left by a little bit. Uh, I'm using the word little bit because I'm going to take this graph after a while and I'm going to show you what it means. Okay, I can take, I can actually do this right now. Whenever the two waves have moved a little bit, we are ending up with this figure. And within this figure, we actually have both both type of uh, interference. We have constructive, we also have destructive. So let me just take a snapshot out of it and I can work with that. Beautiful. Okay, so I want everyone to have your eyes peeled and cooperate. What you can see that certain part of the blue wave, uh, dotted wave, are on the positive side of the uh, equilibrium, and certain parts are on the lower side. And same thing is applicable for the dashed line as well. Which means both the waves are not having perfect constructive effect on each other simultaneously. At some points, they are trying to push the medium particle in the same direction, which we call the constructive interference. At some other points, they're trying to push the particle, medium particle or the guitar string particle in the opposite direction. Those are the locations which you call as destructive interference. Now, this is what I want you to understand. If I now divide this whole thing into multiple different vertical segments, I'm gonna explain how I, uh, how I am coming up with these segment ideas. Let's say I give a vertical line over here, and I'm gonna make this line a bit beautiful. Take it up over here. 
And now I'm going to do transparent selection. What is this? Okay, beautiful. Transparent selection. Yes. So let's see the first line I'm placing up over here. Second one is. I can place it up over here. Third one here. The solio horses, I'm going to explain how, how this position of these lines are coming by. I'm going to bar. Okay. I want everyone to look. This is the, this, in this segment, the dash wave is trying to push the medium particles in the upward direction and the dotted wave is trying to push the medium particles in the downward direction. So here, these two waves are individually trying to push the guitar string in two opposite directions. So this is the part that we're going to define as a segment of destructive interference or destructive superposition. The green wave is basically the sum of the two individual amplitudes. What I want you to understand is that here, the dash wave has an individual displacement of this much, dotted wave has a displacement of this much, you add these two up, you get zero. If you look out for this point, at this point, the dotted wave has a displacement of this much, where the, the sorry, the dash wave has a positive displacement of this much, where the dotted wave has a negative displacement of this much. So if you add these up as vector quantities, you end up with this much. So this is basically the sum of the two displacements plotted. Here, whenever f at, from this point onto the right side, both the waves, the dot and the dash, they are on the positive side of the equilibrium position, which means this part of the wave and also this part of the wave, both of these two part of the waves are trying to push the medium particle, guitar string particle, in the upward direction. So they are essentially helping each other out to move the guitar string. And this is the segment where their individual displacements are going to get added together to give us the total displacement of the guitar string particle. So this is the segment that we can define as a constructive segment. Vice versa, here we have destructive because the dotted is above and the dash is below. So this is destructive. Here, this is once again constructive because here, both the waves are below the equilibrium, which means they are both trying to push the guitar string particle in the same direction in this case, which is downwards. So as long as their pushing duration is same, we're going to say them to be uh, uh, to be constructive. Whenever their pushing directions are opposite, like here or here, or maybe over here, we, this is going to be destructive. Exactly at the midpoint of the destructive se segments, we have zero displacement because here, the, e the distances are exactly equal to each other. Here, the distances are, are exactly equal to each other. So if you add these up, you're going to end up with zero displacement. Same thing over here. So what is essentially happening? These are the points where you are have, having destructive interference in such a way that the individual displacement of the two progressive waves, the their dot and the dash, they are the progressive waves, they, their individual sum is always ending up to be zero. So this is the zero point. Did you understand what I just demonstrated over here? Any question about this part? Anyone, please respond. Sir. Yes. Sir, destructive part I did at the Or at the direction of course, No. The, the dotted wave is trying to push the guitar string. Let's say the guitar string was initially so horizontal. It, this part, this wave is trying to push the guitar string downwards, whereas this part is trying to pull the guitar string upwards. So they are trying to move the guitar string particles in two opposite directions. Okay. Or in other terms, I can say that if only the dotted wave existed, this would be the orientation of the guitar string. If only the dashed wave existed, this will be the original orientation of the guitar string. Whenever both of them simultaneously exist, they produce a combined exhibit behavior. That behavior happens to be the green line. So if you think that this orientation is below the equilibrium, this orientation is above the equilibrium. So this is trying, this part of the wave, dash wave, is trying to push the guitar string in the upward direction. It's trying to lift up the uh, guitar string particles of this location above the equilibrium. Whereas this part of the wave is trying to pull it down. That's why it's destructive, as long as their directions are opposite. But for this part, both the individual waves are on the same side. Dotted wave is also on the positive axis. Dash wave is also on the positive axis. So they are both trying to push the guitar, uh, guitar particles, guitar extreme particles in the upward direction. So they're adding it to each other's effect. That's what I meant. Yes, sir. And the consideration is about, are they acting in the same direction 
or they acting in opposite direction. That's the basic idea. If they're acting in opposite direction, that is destructive. If they're acting in the same direction, that is constructive. So which brings us to, once again, if I look at the first image, okay, not this one. This was the case where both the waves are perfectly constructive to each other. They were all adding up towards the effect. Here, we have a mixture of constructive and destructive. After a while, after another t by eight, which means after at t equals to t by four, when both the waves have moved by quarter of the quarter of a uh, wavelength or quarter of a time period, time has passed by. Now the situation is such that both the waves are perfectly destructive towards each other. This part of the wave is trying to push the wave up. This part of the wave is trying to try and push that wave down, and vice versa, and vice versa, and vice versa. It goes on. So in this instant, the entire guitar string would appear to be perfectly horizontal. Although it is being acted upon by two individual waves. The information is that at this instant of time, both of the waves are perfectly producing complete destructive interference onto each other, eating up each other's displacement completely. So the entire medium at this instant of time is apparent to have no vibration whatsoever. But it does have two individual progressive waves passing through itself. But at this instant, they are matching up so that their effects are completely obliterated by each other. So here that was added up to give us a very large amplitude. Here it is altogether eaten up by their individual opposite effects. So this was the case of full constructive. This is a case of a halfway halfway mixture. This is the case of a complete destructive interference along, along the entire wave. After a while, the waves move on a little bit and you are gonna get once again this scenario. So let me just label this part of the figure. So I'm gonna take this picture, just a second. I might as well take the whole thing. And here is the part is list, you can see that. So what I wanted to see is that uh, this is at t, t equals to zero. This is at t equals to t by eight. This is at t equals to t by four, which means if I draw some vertical lines through here for reference, this dotted line crest traveled from here to here in a time of t by four. And the dashed line crest traveled from here to here in a time of t by four as well, which means which would mean that this is the amount to travel from here to here or to travel from here to here. They are both identical waves only going in opposite direction. The amount of time is t by four, which means this much distance should be lambda by four. Think about it. I, I gave you this equation a bit earlier that lambda is relevant to time period. Time period is relevant to how much angle. This was the equation. That one lambda length is relevant to time period amount of time, which is relevant to 360 degree of phase angle. So the crest of the dot line traveled by this much, the crest of the dashed line traveled by this much, and at a, as a result, at this instant, we have perfectly destructive interference. And then this one travels a little bit more to the right side. So now this crest has traveled to here. So if I plot this line, this line is supposed to go through here, and this crest is now over here. So it has moved by another lambda by a distance. And now you have once again a mixture of these two things, which is basically the reverse figure of this. And if you have a, if you have a look at, good look at, take a good compare, you'll say that if you just horizontally flip this figure, you're gonna get this. So try to see in the bigger picture that how this medium is moving. At t equals to zero, the, all the particles were at their maximum amplitude. Try to have a look at a single particle. Let's say, let's have a look at this particle, this exclusive particle. The, this guitar particle is at, a, at its maximum amplitude, which is A plus A. Individual A being the amplitude of the individual blue waves. Here, it was a bit less. So it is slowly coming towards the equilibrium. Here, it has reached the equilibrium. Now it is going beyond the equilibrium. Here, it is the, the, the guitar string particle is over here. And if you look at the much bigger picture, you'll see that, I don't know. You'll see that after t by two, the entire scenario has flipped. So within a time of uh, half the time period, this crest, crest position is was moving, equilibrium, moving down, and it has come to the trough position. So this is and this this was the situation at t equals to zero. After half time period, 
the entire phase has shifted and this is the new position of this crest and that is equally applicable for all the other points individual points are moving but what is really interesting for you to see that this point is never moving uh, which i cannot draw over here but i can essentially draw up at this point uh, I, i'd like to draw some lines over here let's i'm going to draw them with brown state vertical lines uh, have a look at this orientation yeah this line so i'm going to copy this place it in different places so this position and then this position and then this position okay i have drawn some brown lines over here what i want you to see that you'll find out for any different time instance the guitar string particles located along this brown position these particles are never moving whenever the entire medium is under constant interference here they were at equilibrium here they are undergoing equal amount of opposite interference or equal, uh, equal amount of disturbing interference to be still at the equilibrium here they are still in equilibrium here they are also in equilibrium so there will be certain particles in the in a stationary wave which are never going to move the reason they are never move is because they will always undergo equal and opposite amount of uh, and displacement acted upon as a result they will have perfect dissipative interference all the times so their resultant amplitude would be zero they are not never going to move however there are certain particles for example these particles uh, let me draw them with let's say blue dark blue so for example uh, these particles and these particles they are having the biggest amount of movement they're having the largest amount of movement so these are the locations that we call anti nodes so the stop positions are called the nodes and the maximum amount of amplitudes are called the anti anti nodes all the other particles in between are going to have different amount of amplitude what is very important interesting compared to transverse wave and uh, stationary wave let's say if you consider a progressive wave sorry transverse wave progressive wave, progressive wave for a progressive wave whenever a progressive wave travels from one point to another point all the individual points of the medium can have can have now they all have same amount of amplitude which means all the particles at some point of time will reach their maximum height and eventually they'll fall down to their maximum depth all of them will eventually do that not at the same instant but eventually all of the particles will go through the entire distance this is not true for a transverse wave some particles are having the biggest amount of amplitude for example this particle has an amplitude of this much whereas some particles have zero amplitude which means in a stationary wave part all particles do not have same amplitude some will have very large maximum anti nodes some will have zero nodes and all the particles in between are going to have the individual amplitude values but what is really interesting is that all the particles between two node for example all of these particles they are going to move simultaneously so when they are on the on this position they are all in their maximum individ, individual maximum uh, distance or they are all in the amplitude height here they are all coming down now they are in this orientation so they are all falling down whenever they came to equilibrium all of them are in equilibrium whenever they are going down all of them are simultaneously going down so their motion will be perfectly synchronized they will have different amplitudes they will have different speeds of motion but their movement direction will be always synced hence we will say all of these particles are in phase with each other all of these particles are in phase with each other because their motion direction is exactly same or their motion is synchronized so whenever any of them is going upwards the entire loop of the particles they are all going upwards and vice versa if they are falling downwards they are falling downwards a part 2 bujha gese kina yes sir a part 2 ko uh let me try to find out an animation There is a different animation that I'm looking for. This 
this might as well be a very good video. Yep. Is it a video to make with that? Same video director video essay. Don't come on it. That is an amazing video. Should I write standing wave? Should that work better? This one stationary wave is not working. Same stuff, same stuff. I should have had AJJJ. Hey, 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 hey. This is the thing that I was trying to get at. This is a beautiful animation, whoever did this. This is actually done in, uh, in a mathematical software. Uh, I'll put it into slow motion so that we can all see it. Uh, let's say uh, 0 0.5 speed. And I'll put it into loop so that we don't lose track. So let's have a look. At zero second, have a look. Uh, okay, just keep on looking. You'll see that the green wave is, in this case, traveling to the left, and the blue one is traveling to the right. Can everybody see that? Is it clear enough? I can slow it down yes, more, sir. but yes, can you see? So here we have two progressive waves, the blue and the green. These two are the progressive waves, which are resulting in the stationary wave, which is the red, which is the sum of both of their individual displacements. So at times, they are perfectly matching up. This is the case for full on constructive interference at times i couldn't pause it in the perfect time i might be able to i could go for step motion which is this thing okay i cannot get the perfect frame but somewhere around here they're about to become perfectly uh, flat so it doesn't have within the frame of this uh, video that's why i cannot get that but you do understand so what you can see that these are the points which are never moving at all do you see that this point, yeah. this point, this point. These are the points which are called, calling the nodes. And these are the points which are having the highest amount of amplitude. These are called the, being called the antinodes. And you'll see that all the points within one node to another node, this is sometimes that we refer to as loop, uh, all of them are moving synchronously. They're all going up or they're all going down. That's why we could say that all of these particles are in same phase. Whereas whenever any of these particles is going up, any of the at this particular are all definitely going down Tikna, think about it when any of this uh, when this loop is going upwards obviously this loop is going downwards and vice versa am i correct yes. so this is why any loop of a uh, uh, of a stationary wave is in perfect out of phase with its next loop or consecutive loop or neighboring loop so <clears throat> that Phase angle difference, for example, the phase angle difference between this particle, sorry, I shouldn't have unpaused it. Actually, let me just uh, pause it in a random point. Let's say the phase angle difference, phase angle difference between this particle and this particle is zero degree. Between this particle and this particle is also zero degree. Between this particle and this particle is also zero degree. The phase angle difference between any of the two particles in this loop is zero degree because they are all in phase. The phase angle difference between any particle of this loop with any particle of this loop would be 180 degree. So you can choose anyone. For example, the phase angle difference with this particle with this one, or this particle with that one, or this particle with that one. That phase angle difference is perfectly 180 degree because they are perfectly asynchronized. Whenever this is moving upwards, this is moving downwards, and vice versa, and vice versa. If I go further, the phase angle difference between this loop and this loop can be said to be zero degree technically, or you can say it's 360 degree because they are basically one full loop apart. So we can say that these two loops are perfectly synced. Alternate loops are perfectly synced, but neighboring loops are perfectly unsynced or they're in perfectly out of phase. So neighboring loop particles have a phase difference of 180 degree, whereas alternate loop particles or same loop particles have a phase angle difference of zero degree. Does it make sense? Yes, sir. Information of Bujarat Yes, sir. Answer. It's 736, so I'm gonna uh, close to this class now and I'll pick it up from here uh, next class. And I mean, uh, if you lecture course, you can see that you can do different parts. Don't worry about that. Thank you very much. Uh, I can notes, upload the notes uh, tonight, let's say 10 10 30, because I have another class right now, so I have to finish that and I can give you the notes. No big deal.
टपिकल मक नहीं मैं जानवर 